Welcome to today's episode of Guideline Review of the Week. This is a segment in which we discuss official guidelines and the recent most updates on several clinical topics. And the topic for today is going to be recurrent pregnancy loss. And the source for today is again going to be green top guidelines from Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And this guideline was released on the 19th of June 2023, which is as recent as last year. So here we go. The first question that should arise when you think of recurrent pregnancy loss or what you may also call as recurrent miscarriage is what is it? How do I define it? So there are several definitions that have been given to this terminology of recurrent pregnancy loss. So which one's the ideal one? There is nothing like ideal. It depends on where you practice. What are your official protocols uh, for your location, for the place where you practice? So in our hospital, we follow what uh, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, the ASRM mentions, they say that the evaluation for recurrent pregnancy loss or the definition should stand by two or more pregnancy losses. But they say that it is first trimester pregnancy losses, whereas in our institution, we consider even if we are just having any trimester losses, it be it first or second, we consider them to be significant. So that is how the ASRM defines it. Whereas the ESHRE guidelines, ESHRE is the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology defines it again as two or more than two, but the RCOG defines it as three or more than three. So the point over here to be noted is that, that in this guideline, it is stated that they consider it to be three or more than three. Now, what is the reason that we should be considering this? Now, see, every pregnancy is going to be an event which causes a lot of, uh, it causes a lot of um, mental agony to the couple and especially to the female. So I really wouldn't want to be waiting upon for three miscarriages to happen for me to start evaluating her. And hence in our hospital and me personally in my clinical practice, I prefer to use the criteria of having two or more than two losses of pregnancy for starting the evaluation and treatment on. So what are the reasons or what are the risk factors in which these incidences are increased of recurrent pregnancy loss? So the first one is, increasing maternal age this is something we obviously know so increasing maternal age here stands for more than 35 years so why does this happen the reason as we all know as the age of the mother increases there is also decline in the quality and quantity of the ovum that are produced so when we talk of the quality there is an increase in the disjunction events so basically there is an increase in the amount of aneuploidies that are happening and hence it leads to multiple aneuploidy chromosomal abnormalities to occur in the embryo now our body in itself with evolution has uh, become very smart so wo kehta hai ki i understand ki tujhme ek aisa kharab embryo ban raha hai jisme there is some uh, abnormality there is some chromosomal aneuploidy i will capture that i will pick it up and i will just abort this pregnancy so the number of pregnancies that get aborted because of uh, aneuploidies and in fact aneuploidies are uh, the chromosomal aneuploidies are the most significant they are the topmost reason for which there are recurrent pregnancy losses and when i say topmost it amounts to almost 60 to 80 percent of the total number of pregnancy losses that occur so yes advancing maternal age a definite reason advancing paternal age this is a very uh, debateful point this is something that has been debated of often but studies have shown that when the husband's age increases above 45 years the risk of uh, recurrent pregnancy losses increase the reason that has been stated is that there is dna fragmentation in the sperm that happens as the age increases but it is not as significant as in women and it doesn't even occur as early as it happens in women the next is obviously the number of previous pregnancy losses the number of previous miscarriages has a significant uh, has a significant bearing on what is going to be the outcome of this pregnancy because if the previous pregnancy had some aneuploidy or some reason maybe some endocrinological factor or maybe some anatomical factor maybe there was other uh, there's asherman syndrome then this pregnancy will again have those factors that are continuing since last pregnancy and she will abort previous life birth is said to not have any significant bearing and studies are still on they do say a few studies do say that if a female has had previous live birth then the risk of uh, the risk of having a recurrent pregnancy loss decreases but no studies have shown that recurrent pregnancy loss and mind you i'm not talking of sporadic pregnancy loss jo aise ho jata hai i am talking about consecutive pregnancy losses and in this case in this study they have considered three or more than three 
pregnancy losses. So previous life birth doesn't have any bearing on it. Black ethnic background obviously doesn't stand uh, much significance in our uh, in our socio cultural uh, status. Consanguineous relationship. This is something we often ask patients in our history who have come to us with recurrent pregnancy loss. Time and again, evidence has now started showing that consanguinity doesn't really have that much of a bearing. Yes, it might lead to sporadic miscarriages, but recurrent pregnancy losses are not ho raha hai because at some point, the right combination of gametes is going to come together and it will le uh, lead to a good pregnancy in consanguinous marriages. So, consanguinous relationship is still under study, but the recent evidence states that it is not that a significant factor. The next one, smoking. Obviously, any amount of smoking, when you smoke, it has carcinogens. The carcinogens have a direct impact on the DNA of the embryo of the gametes and it leads to several abnormalities and those abnormalities are detected by the body and those pregnancies are aborted. Excessive alcohol consumption. Now, this is definitely a factor, but the amount of alcohol that various books state is different. This guideline states that more than 10 units and by 10 units, they intend to say that anything more than 100 ml per week per week is uh, is detrimental. Whereas Berek and Novak states that anything more than even three drinks a week and by three drinks, we intend to say around 30 to 40 ml of alcohol per week can be detrimental and can lead to recurrent pregnancy losses. Then excessive caffeine consumption and by excessive caffeine consumption, uh, includes all the people who consume lots of coffee and the amount that should be restricted to is less than 200 mg per day. So basically if you are consuming less than this amount uh, and I would say rather if you are consuming less than this then you would have a uh, lesser chance of having a recurrent pregnancy loss but if you are consuming more than that then you will have a much higher chance of having a recurrent pregnancy loss. Apart from that extremes of weights if a patient is too lean or if a patient is too overweight again a significant risk factor and finally several chemical exposures in the environment can again induce a carcinogenic effect in your body and can uh, deter the embryo from developing and again it forms a very significant reason for recurrent pregnancy loss so these are the risk factors that uh, carry or that have a bearing on how the outcome of your current pregnancy is going to be so moving ahead to individual causes now so when i talk of the individual causes there are multiple that i have enlisted over here and the way in which i'll be discussing them is that first i would be stating what the guideline mentions about the cause then i'll be telling you about the second point would be what is the way of diagnosing them and the third part would be how do i treat them all the significant causes are enlisted in this video and it is going to be in three parts. The first is what is it? The second is how do you diagnose it? And third is how do you treat it? So the first one is thrombophilia. Thrombophilia, thrombo is clotting. Philia is an attraction. So basically attraction to clotting. Yeah, we can also call it hypercoagulability. So thrombophilias have various ways of inheritance or other various ways in which they can present. So so when we talk of that, if I'm going to be talking of thrombophilia, I'll write it as TP. It can be either in the form of something that you're born with, what I also call as inherited and something that you acquire in your life, something that you get in your life. In the inherited ones, I'll tell you what are the ones that come. There is factor five lead in mutation. Then there is prothrombin gene mutation. There is anticoagulant c and s deficiency c and s deficiency then there is uh, antithrombin 3 deficiency antithrombin 3 deficiency and uh, more of these but the significant ones aren't these the significant ones are the ones that is acquired and in acquired is the most popular or what i would call as a celebrity thrombophilia and that is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or simply put APLA syndrome. It is something that you acquire in your life and it is not something that you have gotten since birth with you. So how do you diagnose it? Now this is the guideline that states that definitely it has an increased chance of uh, causing here. You can see that there is an increased chance of recurrent miscarriages and what are the what is the diagnostic criteria? We use the Sydney criteria. Sydney criteria is used for it and in Sydney criteria we have we have to fulfill one clinical criteria 
एंड वन लेबोरेटरी क्राइटेरिया ट्वेल्व वीक्स अपार्ट सो इन द क्लिनिकल क्राइटेरिया आई कैन इधर हैव अ वैस्क्यूलर एपिसोड और आई कैन हैव अ प्रेगनेंसी रिलेटेड एपिसोड so vascular episode relates with any history of any thrombotic event in my body in the past it can be a thrombotic stroke it can be a thrombotic coronary mi it can be an episode of dvt that is deep venous thrombosis with pulmonary embolism it can be something like uh, central venous sinus there are venous sinuses in our brain so it can be a central venous sinus uh, thrombus so any history of any thrombotic event in the past constitutes as one clinical criteria and that is fulfilled then the clinical criteria is fulfilled and if not the clinical criteria then we have the pregnancy related criteria so over here you can see that the pregnancy related criteria states on the left side you will see that three or more we can divide it into either the pregnancy can be below 10 weeks or it can be after 10 weeks so if it is below 10 weeks then three or more consecutive miscarriages before 10 weeks three or more consecutive miscarriages before 10 weeks constitute constitutes one pregnancy related criteria it has to be any one of these three criteria to be fulfilled for the clinical criteria to be fulfilled and not all of them and if it is after 10 weeks then if there is an iufd of more than 10 weeks because of some unexplained cause by unexplained we intend to say that there is no meconium passage there was no thick loop of uh, there was no tight loop of cord around neck there was no congenital anomaly so it is just unexplained it has just happened or if there was some placental disease by placental disease i intend to say severe preeclampsia which is obviously a placental event it can be severe preeclampsia or it can be something like doppler changes there was absent end diastolic flow there was reversal of end diastolic flow any of these so any placental disease but something that is occurring before 34 weeks in a previous pregnancy constitutes a clinical criteria to fulfill the laboratory criteria i look at three antibodies i say it is a play of a b c as easy as a b c with a i remember it as lupus anticoagulants with b it is beta 2 glycoprotein and with c it is anti cardiolipin antibody so a b and c that is how i remember it <laughs> and uh, lupus anticoagulants doesn't have an antibody to it but uh, but uh, beta 2 glycoprotein and lupus anticoagulants you will see over here that they have given that igg or igm to either one of these is uh, to be detected in a female 12 weeks apart now if a patient is though coming to you in her pregnancy and she is saying so that i have just conceived and um, i've just conceived i have had three or four uh, previous pregnancy losses and i have conceived again and if i do a apla profile and if it comes out to be positive for any of these i will not tell her ki tu aur 12 hafte ruk ja ki main tere liye iski treatment initiate karunga no she has come to you you just just give her a provisional diagnosis of apla syndrome and start her on it obviously you can repeat it after 12 weeks yes a point to be noted that apla profile or these antibody testing can be done in pregnancy the reason is the coagulation factors that increase in pregnancy which will affect the inherited thrombophilia profile will not affect the apla syndrome profile because these are antibodies that are not related to the clotting factors and the quantities in your body so this is the point that has to be remembered very well so these are the three antibodies that have to be detected either one of them have to be detected also a small point to be noted is that uh, lupus anticoagulants can definitely be detected or acla profile acla antibody that is anti cardiolipin antibody has to be detected in either moderate or high concentrations but beta 2 glycoprotein has to be in high titers only in your body to be positive why does this uh, cause apla syndrome cause death the reason is all these anti phospholipid antibodies we have read about cell membranes in your pathology in your physiology earlier even in your 12th standard we have a phospholipid bilayer in all the cell membranes this phospholipid bilayer is attacked by these antibodies especially in the placental vessels the small spiral vessels in it now what this does is when it attacks them these endo these these endothelial cells just break down when they break down what happens when there is destruction of endothelium there is atherogenesis there is atherosclerosis that happens there is atherosis there is there are blockages there is vasospasm so because of this vasospasm the vasospasm is because of the release of thromboxane a2 when the endothelium is damaged it releases thromboxane a2 which is a vasoconstricting agent so this vasoconstriction and atherosclerosis both of them combine and they combine to block the supply of blood to the fetus or the embryo and this results in abortion or pregnancy loss so how do i diagnose it we have already spoken about it on how do we diagnose it 
yes so we have already discussed on um, how do we diagnose it so over here we have spoken about what is the treatment that should be given to these patients the treatment in these patients involves giving aspirin and heparin now obviously these are antibodies that are increasing the amount of clotting in my body they are leading to increase in uh, clots in the body so to avoid that i'll be starting these patients on something that i call as heparin the heparin can either be unfractionated or lmwh though i prefer giving lmwh myself because um, it is easier to be given and it has to be given just once a day so the dose that is to be started is 40 milligram subcutaneously has to be given once a day whereas if a patient has history of any thrombotic event in the past then it has to be given twice a day apart from that aspirin has to be given in the dose of 75 milligram it is a low dose aspirin that is given ACOG recommends it to be 150 mg whereas RCOG recommends it to be 75 milligram I personally prefer to give 150 milligram so why 150 the actual dose that is required for the anti-inflammatory action of aspirin in pregnancy is 81 milligram we do not get an 81 milligram tablet but we do get 75 and we get 150 so i prefer giving a higher dose that is 150 which though in itself is a low dose aspirin only so you can give either of them but aspirin has to be started and heparin also has to be started and the heparin has to be continued even after delivery because after delivery there is an increase in the body's coagulation profile there is an hypercoagulability in your body that happens it's clear to prevent any thrombotic event like dvt after delivery you have to continue it till 6 to 12 weeks so the treatment includes to briefly speak aspirin low dose 75 mg in first trimester rather from first trimester and lmwh or unfractionated heparin unfractionated heparin that has to be started preconceptionally or it can be started in first trimester and has to be continued till has to be continued till 6 to 12 weeks after delivery that is how you treat as uh, apla syndrome properly now what's next the next that we were going to discuss was next that we were going to discuss was inherited thrombophilia the ones that you are born with the ones that you are born with includes all these mutations that i have mentioned over here these include factor 5 lead in mutation factor 5 is one of the coagulation factors prothrombin gene mutation prothrombin is yet another factor which is uh, a coagulation uh, which is a coagulant in your body a coagulation factor protein c and protein s are anticoagulating factors in your body basically they inhibit the action of factor 5 protein c and s inhibit the action of factor 5 and factor 8 so their work is basically to increase anticoagulation in the body so if they are deficient there is obviously going to be increased coagulation in the body if they are deficient Something similar that happens with antithrombin as well. Antithrombin, as the name suggests, it is something that acts against thrombin. It inhibits thrombin, again leading to anticoagulation. But when it is deficient, it leads to increased coagulability in the body. They say that, uh, that testing for these is a very resource intensive thing. They are expensive tests. You go and ask a local laboratory on how much do they do. Not all labs do these tests in first place. And the ones who do, they find it very expensive to do it. So they recommend that only when all the tests have come negative is when you do these inherited thrombophilia testing. And usme se bhi, they say that you only test for factor 5 lead in mutation. You check for prothrombin gene mutation and protein S deficiency. You do not test for, you do test for protein S deficiency. You do test for factor 5 lead in mutation. You do test for prothrombin gene mutation. You do not test for antithrombin 3. You do not test for protein C deficiency. Also, there is one more that is M -meth methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency now this enzyme is required in the formation of homocysteine 2 methionine in the body now this enzyme catabolizes or rather catalyzes this reaction so when this decreases there is an increase in the body amount of homocysteine which leads to hyperhomocysteinemia now homocysteine is known it is known to cause hypercoagulation in your body but 
hyper homo uh, hyper homocysteinemia is one of the causes of uh, increased uh, coagulation in your body but the testing for this is again resource intensive and it is recommended only and only if all of the tests are negative otherwise when all of the tests are negative i would first do these tests and if any of these is positive the treatment of this is very similar to what is for apla profile uh, apla patients i have to give them lmwh as you can see over here the evidence and guidelines says that thrombo that thrombo prophylaxis has to be considered for women with factor 5 lead in protein s deficiency and prothrombin mutation because there is not enough of evidence to not treat it so i would rather treat them and it has shown that treating these three uh, problems these three inherited thrombophilias has given better pregnancy outcomes and hence treat them with aspirin as well as heparin again so this finishes the part of thrombophilia we move on to the next one and that is the genetic factor of recurrent pregnancy loss so in genetic factor of recurrent pregnancy loss i have either parental or i have chromosomal or chromosomal or i'll say embryonal jo embryo ban gaya dono parents se usse so parental has mother and father ke individual gametes the mother will have the ovum the father will have the sperm whereas the embryo will be a combination of both of them so they say that obviously we have already learned that chromosomal anu aneuploidies are the cause of almost 60 to 80 percent of the abortions whereas this is a cause of only 2 to 5 percent of abortions so when a female comes to me in uh, her first trimester she tells me that she's bleeding uh, through vagina and this is something that has happened in her previous three pregnancies as well previous two pregnancies as well where she has lost her babies in the first trimester she had sudden uh, spontaneous abortion then what i'll do is they say that the tests for these have to be done because it is shown that parental genetic problems and by genetic problems i mean translocations what is translocation translocation is if this was your chromosome and i'll make it with a blue one if this was your chromosome translocation is there are either balanced or unbalanced translocation so in unbalanced translocation now if this was your chromosome let me just make if this were your two chromosomes let me use another pen so in balanced translocation this will go here and this will go over here so it is balancing out ek dusre mein bas exchange ho raha whereas in unbalanced there is going to be only ek ka dusre mein ja raha hai aur material add kar raha hai sirf idhar ka idhar aaya and this has added on to the genetic material of one chromosome now unbalanced and balanced translocations are known to be causes of recurrent pregnancy loss and this happens in the parents and hence the testing for this that is recommended they say is that cytogenetic testing should be done over here they are saying that cytogenetic testing is to be given in that parental peripheral blood basically the blood that you collect from the vein has to be subjected to karyotyping you can see that karyotyping is given over here it should be done so for the parents you should be doing karyotyping whereas if a female has come to you with uh, yet another episode of bleeding pv and now when you do your ultrasound and you confirm that um, the fetus is no longer there there is just incomplete abortion so you end up doing suction evacuation or dilatation and curettage so the products of conception that you get they are to be subjected to as well cytogenetic analysis has to be tested for the pregnancy tissue is unsuccessful but to get maximum success you have to understand ki jo product of conception aa raha hai those are dead cells and dead cells mein karyotyping ya fish fluorescent in situ hybridization cannot be done so for those product of because they are dead cells so for dead cells to be cultured you need to do tests either like micro chromosomal micro array or whole genome sequencing or next generation sequencing whole exome sequencing is another thing that you can do either of these tests have been done have to be done for the product of conception why so that i know what is the problem in that embryo which is leading to recurrent pregnancy losses also with the parental karyotype i would know whether the parent in itself is having that problem which is 
the cause of that recurrent pregnancy loss whereas if i'm possibly getting that product of conception which a lot of cases is not available the patient has already aborted or they come to me in a preconceptional period when they do not have any embryo inside at that point i cannot be testing for product of conception but if a female is coming to me in my emergency and she's telling me that uh, in an emergency duty of mine and she's coming to my hospital and she's telling me that she's bleeding and she requires dilatation and curettage or suction evacuation then i will collect those products of conception and i will subject them to that test what should be the treatment for these couples once i am done detecting those tests in her next pregnancy i would either do pgta or pgtsr now what is pgta and pgtsr it is pre implantation genetic testing for aneuploidies or pre implantation genetic testing for structural uh, structural rearrangements structural rearrangements are basically translocations aneuploidies obviously all know so this is what was earlier called as pre implantation genetic screening or pre implantation genetic diagnosis these were the earlier names now this is what they are called so basically i'll collect the gametes of the patient and i will test ki isme acha wala egg kaun sa hai acha wala sperm kaun sa hai then i will do in vitro fertilization for them and i will put the good embryo inside or i will test the embryo directly to know whether the problem has occurred in the embryo again so i will do this so basically the treatment for these couples are going to be pre implantation genetic testing followed by ivf so that i only give the patient a good genetic embryo so this is what we speak of the genetic factors we are done with genetic factors and uh, thrombophilia the next one is anatomical factor anatomical again can be something that you are either born with or it can be something that you have acquired in your life so it can either be congenital or it can be acquired in congenital you have things like septate uterus or bicornuate uterus they say that these are the two and especially septate uterus septate uterus has a very high chance of increase as they have given over here that in congenital uh, uterine anomalies there is an increased risk of miscarriage in which there is an increased risk with septate uterus which are mullerian abnormalities more than bicornuate uterus there is no risk with arcuate or unicornuate uterus there is no risk of increasing uh, recurrent pregnancy loss there will rather be mal presentation if your uterus is something like this which is an arcuate uterus you probably might have a breech presentation baby but it won't lead to recurrent pregnancy loss or if you have something like a unicornuate uterus you will have probably you will have mal presentation but it won't lead to recurrent pregnancy loss whereas in bicornuate in which you have two such uteri there is going to be or if you have a uterus and it has a septum in between there is going to be recurrent pregnancy loss the reason is the embryo cannot implant or if the embryo manages to implant there is not enough space for the placenta to grow and hence this can be a major problem so how do i treat it first of all how do i diagnose it the diagnosis also there is one more part that i did, didn't mention there is cervical insufficiency in anatomical parts obviously there is not going to be any problem with your tubes and your ovaries because if there is tubal factor or ovarian factor problem then a patient won't conceive in uh, first place a patient just won't conceive there will be infertility but this is what we are talking about recurrent pregnancy loss so the tubes ha are have to be normal because the sperm and ovum are meeting well the ovulation has to be normal so the ovarian factor is also normal the problem is with only the uterus and cervix in cervical factor we call it cervical insufficiency but cervical insufficiency what we also call as the short cervix short cervix jiska hum log ne ek arbitrary length less than 2.5 cm de di hai the problem with this is recurrent सेकेंड ट्राइमेस्टर लॉस सेकेंड ट्राइमेस्टर में बार बार वो बच्चा खराब होते रहता है एंड हेंस हाउ डू वी डायग्नोस इट द मोडलिटी ऑफ चॉइस इज फॉर यूट्रेन एबनॉमिलिटीज ऑल यू हैव टू डू इज इधर हाउ डू आर डायग्नोस इट द प्रेफर्ड मोडलिटी इज थ्री डी यूएस जी इफ नॉट फॉर अ थ्री डी यूएस जी आई कैन ऑल्सो डू एम आर आई ऑफ द पेलविस टू नो वेदर देर इज एनी प्रॉब्लम इन प्लेसेस वेर आई डोंट हैव दीज i can also do an hsg which is a very primitive way of knowing but these are other ways of knowing the other way of knowing is also hysteroscopy can be done hysteroscopy is not only diagnostic but it will also help me to treat the problem if there is a septum i can resect the septum if there is uh, if there is any uh, myoma there i can resect the myoma now we spoke here about the congenital problems that this female can have what about the acquired ones acquired ones can be something like a submucosal myoma or a fibroid 
or there can be Asherman syndrome. Asherman syndrome is basically when there is uh, there is adhesion between the anterior and posterior uterine wall. There can be something like a polyp which is there or adenomyosis. Though this these two will not lead to recurrent pregnancy losses as much as much as a spo sporadic abortion but these two are very significant so how do i diagnose it again ultrasound is going to help me with that or an hsg will help me see asherman syndrome because when i push the dye inside through hsg test i see that there are multiple patches where there is fibrosis and there is no filling of the dye the treatment for all of these can be the treatment Yes, definitely treatment has to be given. Though they say that there is lack of evidence, it is said that there has to be an option that is given to these patients for expectant versus surgical management. We in our institution prefer surgical management. If there is a congenital problem, something like something like a septate uterus, we do resection of the septum. And if it is something that is acquired like a myoma, then we do myomectomy, we do hysteroscopic myomectomy. So the treatment has to be surgical, either a myomectomy or septum resection of this Asherman syndrome. Then I do adhesiolysis with the scissors by putting in a hysteroscope. So that is how I'll be diagnosing and treating the anatomical cause of recurrent pregnancy loss. The next one and the most important one over here, I'll say one that a lot of people uh, fail to understand is endocrinological causes which is a cause of abortion in almost 15 to 20 percent of the patients it consists of either there can be uncontrolled diabetes or thyroid disease here they are saying that if it is in control then there is no risk of recurrent uh, pregnancy loss if it is uncontrolled then definitely so the first one is going to be diabetes mellitus in endocrinological endocrinological is hormonal cause of rep uh, rpl that is recurrent pregnancy loss. The second one is subclinical hypothyroidism. What is subclinical hypothyroidism in which the TSH is increased but the T3 and T4 are normal. So the TSH is raised and this is normal. So what is raised? I say that this is by definition from more than 2.5 to 10 the level of TSH is said to be subclinical hypothyroidism if it is more than 10 then it is called as overt hypothyroidism the presence of thyroid antibodies so when I test for thyroid I not only have to do serum TSH T3 and T4 I also have to test for anti thyroid peroxidase antibodies because this gives me an indicator that this female is either is either having Hashimoto's thyroiditis or she might have thyroiditis at some point in future. So testing for thyroid antibodies is definitely recommended and definitely increases the risk of recurrent miscarriage. Even if the TSH is between just like let's say 2.5 to 4, it has to be tested. I will be speaking more on this later. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, you obviously all know. Hyperprolactinemia, raised serum prolactin. Yes, and finally luteal phase defect. What is luteal phase defect in your body? They are saying though that this has insufficient evidence. So not really recommended. But what is the meaning of luteal phase defect? Your luteal phase of the cycle is the second half of your cycle. In that second half, your corpus luteum is secreting progesterone. If there is a defect in this, there is going to be decreased progesterone. So to diagnose it, we have to test for serum progesterone levels and less than 10 nanogram per ml is said to be serum progesterone is said to be a diagnostic factor for luteal phase defect though people do believe that this is uh, not really something that requires testing but a lot of people do it so how do i manage this we obviously know if there is diabetes mellitus start this patient on either uh, metformin you can either start the patient on metformin or you can start this patient on uh, insulin you can either do this or if a female is having hypothyroidism, you test for TSH. Now the normal TSH, if you do in any random lab or in any lab or in your hospital, you will see that they say that the normal levels are below 5.5. The normal levels of TSH are said to be less than 5.5. But for pregnant women, the levels have to be below 2.5. This is the upper normal limit of for a pregnant female. So for a pregnant woman, this is a normal level between 2.5 and 4 is something that is a very dicey area if the levels are above 4 i definitely give her thyroxine supplements thyronom, eltroxin anything but if the level is between this 
American Thyroid Association says that you should be treating women if this level is between this level and if she has infertility or if she has positive anti-TPO antibodies. If she doesn't have either of this, you do not need to treat this patient. But if you have a level between this and you have either of these factors, then you need to treat these women because that is probably a cause of her infertility. Whereas if a female has TSH level more than 4, you definitely treat her. You do not wait on for anything else to know whether you need to treat her or not. This is what American Thyroid Association says. Our guidelines say that you don't need to treat this female between this level and you need to just treat her above level of 4 if the TSH level is above 4 irrespective of her T3 and T4 levels. But in my opinion, in my experience for women with these risk factors with either recurrent pregnancy loss or infertility or with positive anti tpo antibodies, I do prefer to treat even women for the TSH levels between 2.5 and 4. The ideal level for pregnancy though is definitely less than 2.5. So as you see, this is the RCOG guideline as the American Thyroid Association says that we should be treating, but they say that the women who have a level that is less than 4 and above 2.5, they should not be treated. Whereas they also say for every pregnant female, TSH has to be tested in every trimester ideally if she is hypothyroid and if not at her first visit at least. Also, they say that in women with hypothyroidism, you should be giving or in patients in whom you probably think there is luteal phase defect. We do not have adequate evidence. But in these women, you can be giving progesterone supplement. And the ideal progesterone is micronized progesterone. So over here, they are giving micronized progesterone. That is to be given 400 milligram twice a day, preferably given by vagina because it attains higher uterine concentration than systemic or what you call as oral micronized progesterone. We also have a better drug which is not yet incorporated in this guideline and that is didrogesterone which is a ultraviolet treated form of uh, form of uh, progesterone but it is very expensive and hence we still prefer to give micronized progesterone. For women with hyperprolactinemia as we had discussed you should be giving them a treatment with bromocryptin or cabergolin. It increases the dopamine concentration in your body and eventually reduces the concentration of prolactin. The next and the last causes that we are going to be talking about here are the immune and infective causes. In immune they say that there are multiple tests that you can do. You can uh, test for the major histocompatibility complex. These are all words that you might have seen in your pathology books last. Histo HLA antigen. You can uh, test for these, but there is no proven benefit of testing these or NK that is natural killer cell concentration. These tests are not really recommended. There are people who give treatments for these women, uh, but evidence wise not yet proven. We still have to be uh, waiting for what evidence says. There is treatment like leukocyte immunization that we give leukocyte immunization is basically giving a patient some antigen and increasing the leukocytes in the body so we call this leukocyte uh, immunization or people even prefer giving uh, ivig ivig is basically intravenous immunoglobulin they give this to inhibit all these factors but these are not yet evidentially proven at some point i do believe they'll be proven that they have a benefit but currently the guideline doesn't support the use in infective the most important cause is torch, toxoplasma, rubella, CMV and herpes simplex virus. Do not test. Why? You get that infection. If you get it in your life, then after a point, you will become immune to it. You will develop immunoglobulins, IgG against it. And hence it will cause probably one sporadic miscarriage. It won't cause recurrent pregnancy loss. So testing for torch is absolutely idiotic in patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. Because this will lead to one miscarriage. It won't lead to multiple miscarriages because this is an infection. Once you get an infection, you get immune to it. So, shayad mujhe ek miscarriage ho jai, but multiple times nahi hoga. So, don't test for it. Don't test for other tests of gonorrhea, syphilis as well. They say ki endometritis can be a cause. Do not test it. It doesn't have any uh, prognostic outcome, nor does it have any specific treatment. So, testing for torch profile should not be done in recurrent pregnancy losses. There is no use for it. Finally, we have male factor. In male factor, they say that there is a definite uh, research has shown that because of DNA fragmentation that happens in sperms due to increased paternal age, 
it has shown that uh, there are increased chances of uh, miscarriages but the testing for that is not yet recommended outside of research purpose at some point aage ja ke we can do it or if we if and when we do it we can use ivf for helping these women get pregnant with a good quality sperm in which there is no dna fragmentation so the treatment for this will again stay as ivf so this is it about the rcog's guideline on recurrent pregnancy loss um there is a lot more to it if you are going to be reading books but this is what the guideline says it's a guideline of, of around what 20 to 25 pages i have summarized it in this video of i think around 20 minutes to half an hour i hope this lecture was useful to you make your notes this is something that uh, is not that easy to remember but if you are to ask me that how do i approach a female who comes to me with recurrent pregnancy loss then if a patient is coming to me with bleeding per vaginum in her first trimester i mean if she's coming to me in a pregnant state then the product of conception that i'll be getting send it for cma or whole genome sequencing this is an uh, this is a test that can be done only if she comes to me if she's pregnant if not for all other patients who come to me first do the parental karyotyping then test for apla profile in which we test for a b and c lupus anticoagulants beta 2 glycoprotein and acla that is anti cardiolipin antibody do not test for inherited thrombophilia that is uh, that is protein s deficiency or prothrombin gene mutation or uh, leiden 5 mutation because it has to be tested only when all these tests come to be negative so it's a optional test after that do a 3d usg or an mri of the pelvis to know whether there is any problem also check the cervical length to check for cervical integrity then when a patient is coming to you test her endocrinological factors test her hba1c test her blood sugars test her prolactin levels and tsh with anti tpo levels obviously when you do this the t3 and t4 will also be done so these are the tests take a screenshot write it down which you have to do for all patients who are coming to you with recurrent pregnancy loss there is no doubt about it do this tests it will give you a diagnosis for almost 80 to 90% of the patients in 10% of the patient it is just like the results are yet but uh, we just don't know it is idiopathic we will know with further research on these topics thank you for listening i hope this was a good session see you in our next lecture on grow on conceptual obg do mail us do uh, send in your questions if you have any do contact us on our social media handles if you have any doubts on this topic signing off dr aditya over here